Hello. It's True Crime Tuesday. Uh, still no intro, so there's that. Uh, we're going to get right into it today because I know this one's going to be a pretty long one and I am worried about it having to be two parts. Uh, it most likely will, but I guess we'll we'll go through this and see where we end up. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Also, it is, in fact, Tuesday. I hate recording on the day that podcasts are supposed to come out, but this week has been just absolutely insane, and it continues to grow more insane, so that's all very exciting. Uh, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about Larry Eiler. Um, it's funny because he's a lesser known, in my opinion, uh, serial killer. He was active in the same-ish area as John Wayne Gacy, just right after John Wayne Gacy was caught and apprehended. Um, I really tried my best to get this to be, a, a, I guess, an acceptable amount of time. My first draft of the notes for this episode was 38 pages long. Uh, I managed to pare it down to 10. It is absolutely one hell of a story with a lot, a lot of ins and outs, and there's a lot of detail I wanted to cover, and so I just wanted to make sure that I did, well, that I give it justice and the victims their justice, but also do a good job of covering this. So that's why I, instead of paring it down to some type of, I, I just didn't want it to be super duper long, but at the same time, like, I cut out as much as I thought I could. Like, a lot of the legal jargon of all of it, I, I gave the gist, and I'm talking too much already, so here we go. So, like I said, today we're talking about Larry Eiler, and if you've never heard of him, that's okay, because I didn't really know who he was either, and that's obviously the point of why we're talking about him today. He was born on December 21st, 1952 in Crawfordsville, Indiana, which is a little bit northwest of Indianapolis and also the home of Wabash College. He was the youngest son of George Eiler and Shirley Kennedy. Uh, unfortunately, George was an alcoholic who was known to um, be mentally and physically abusive to his wife and children. So George and Shirley separated in 1954 when Larry was only two years old. Because of the split, Larry and his sister spent a lot of time in the care of babysitters and foster families, but on some occasions, they were left in the care of Larry's eldest sibling, who was 10 years old at the time. Shirley was doing her best to make ends meet by taking multiple jobs, so she was waitressing and working in a factory during the week and bartending during the weekends. And to be fair, she was trying to raise four children under the age of 10 by herself, and that is no easy task. So honestly, I mean, the fact that she took so many jobs and was still trying to raise her children, that's crazy. I mean, good for you, Shirley. I think she probably did the best she could in that situation. So Larry was often visited by his mother, even when he was in foster care, saying that being separated and brought back together should only make the family closer emotionally. Um, and I still also think that's respectable as well, that Shirley was still trying to visit. She was still trying to play an active part in Larry's life. Uh, I don't know how well that worked out in the long run, but it was nice that it's nice that she was still trying. Um, obviously, financially, when you have four kids, you kind of have to make sacrifices in the time you get to spend with them. So in school, Larry was active in sports and known by his teacher as a quiet, good student. But Larry was often bullied because he was poor and his mother was divorced and he had very few friends growing up. In 1957, when Larry was five, Shirley remarried, but that marriage only lasted a year. In 1960, when Larry's eight, Shirley remarried again, but that couple was divorced in 1964. Larry would later recount that his first two stepfathers were heavy drinkers and were emotionally and physically abusive, just like his father. At 10, Larry was placed in a home for unruly boys. He had been acting erratically and was being stubborn, but he, in general, was just misbehaving. And I'm sure, as a kid, his mom's third marriage could have had something to do with it. Either he was acting out or the stepdad wanted him out of the picture. I mean, who really knows? Some kids take really well to divorces and step parents and other children don't do so well. So, it, I, I mean, it sounds like he was going through a really tumultuous time in his childhood. Larry was at the home for a few weeks and he was unable to handle the separation. He was returned back to Shirley's care after that. Sometime after this, he was psychologically evaluated, and at that time, it was found that he had normal intelligence, 
severe insecurity and had an extreme fear of separation and abandonment. And I think those are all valid feelings. I think um, a child who's gone through really tumultuous changes in his life uh, could definitely have a fear of separation and abandonment. I think those are all pretty on brand for the type of childhood he had. Apparently, it was stated at the age of 10, it was irregular for a child to have this level of anxiety. And because of that, psychologists assume that these fears came from a trigger in his home life. And so then he gets sent to Fort Wayne to attend a Catholic boys school. So my thought about that is that so he has an extreme fear of separation. So you're going to separate him and move him 150 miles away. Like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I mean, whatever. Uh, he lasted six months and then returned back home. Upon reaching puberty, Larry discovered that he was homosexual, and he was open about it with his family, and from my understanding, they were cool with it. Larry, however, because he had pretty much been religious since childhood, hated himself for, him sexu for his sexuality. He had an occasional girlfriend in high school, but nothing was ever physical. Larry dropped out of high school, but eventually got his GED, and then he attended Indiana State University. And that'll be an overlying theme, you'll notice. He worked as a private security guard at the Marion County General Hospital, but lost the job after six months. Then he worked at a shoe store. While employed there, he got familiar with Indianapolis's gay community. He frequented gay bars and had several casual flings with men. And according to some of those partners, Larry wouldn't look at them while having intercourse and would shout profanities like bitch and whore while having sex. By the mid-1970s, he was well known within the community, but specifically with those um, with le leather fetishes. Surface level Larry was considered good looking, laid back, um, and he was a bodybuilder and he had a great relationship with his mother and his sister. And unfortunately though, anyone who had a sexual relationship with him got to see a different side, which was violent and sadistic. He would bludgeon his partner and then inflict knife wounds to the torso without consent, which I'm not here to kink shame. I've never been here to kink shame, but it not having consent in a sexual relationship for anything is a huge red flag. Um, it's If you're not agreeing to something, it's not cool. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, Larry stopped working at the shoe store and then worked as a house painter. Um, a little sidebar about Larry. Even though he never served our country, he often wore Marine Corps t-shirts, which isn't necessarily illegal, but it's kind of a dick move. At some point, he moves into a condo in Terre Haute in, uh, sorry, with 30-year-old library science professor. His name was Robert Little. The two meet in 1974 at Indiana State University, um, but I'm not sure when the living arrangement occurred. Larry would have 20 or yeah he would have been 22 at this time both men were part of the lgbtq plus community but robert didn't go and pick up men the way larry did so usually larry would go out and pick up two men who would be willing to have sex with larry but also with robert little so he's kind of an all-inclusive wingman if you want to think like that uh this was a little weird because what larry <laughs> when larry and robert had met uh, you know, when he had his brief stint at ISU, and they did not have a sexual relationship. And it's probably, like, best described because, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to explain this in a way that makes sense for my brain. Robert Little was 38, Larry was 22, and they had a platonic father and son relationship, which with that age gap makes sense, and the lack of a real good father figure in Larry's life, it kind of makes sense that he would pick you know, this science professor, Robert Little, to be his fake dad. Uh, the weird thing is, though, is that most people who have that type of relationship do not go pick up a man for their father to sleep with. So he, I mean, there's nothing wrong, as, like I said, as long as everybody in this thing is consenting to do everything the way it is. Not that weird, but is a little bit weird, but different st strokes for different folks. So, I, you know. It is what it is. Uh, I guess it just, I, the, the relationship dynamic is really skewed and it has a lot more layers than I think a lot of people really thought it really had. So apparently this arrangement worked for everyone involved because it goes on pretty uneventful, uneventfully for a really long time. So on August 3rd, 1978, Larry picks up a 19-year-old hitchhiker named Craig Long. 
During this ride, Larry makes some sexual advances toward Craig, which he does not accept. Craig tried to leave the vehicle, but Larry was not going to let that happen. Um, and I don't know if that's because of ego or pride. Um, really, who knows? I don't know if it was because he, he made a sexual advance and now Craig knew he was interested in men and like Larry really didn't want anybody out there who wasn't accepting his advances to know that. I'm not sure. Um, either way, Eiler uh, drives his pickup truck to a deserted field and forces Craig at knife point into the back of the pickup truck where he's forced to undress and then was bound at the ankles and handcuffed. During this exchange, Craig takes off and tries to flee. Larry runs after him and stabs Craig once in the chest and he punctured his lung. Craig plays dead and it works. Larry leaves him alone, which is like, that's awesome. Like, after the coast was clear, Craig makes a break for a nearby house and was able to get help. And fuck yeah, Craig. Like, good, for, you know, <laughs> just, I, I feel like you never hear of those stories working. Um, and I'm really happy for Craig it did. The next bit of the story doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me from Larry's point of view, but here it is. So either that evening or the next day, Larry comes back and he gives the sheriff the keys to the handcuffs, which are still on Craig. And he says that he stabbed the boy accidentally, which of course, Larry was arrested and taken into custody. Um, inside his truck, police found a hunting knife, a metal tipped whip, a butcher knife, a different set of handcuffs, tear gas, and a sword. All average things that the normal person keeps in their pickup truck for, you know, all your normal people hobbies. This next bit, though, shows you exactly how charismatic Larry was. So Larry was charged with aggravated battery, which honestly, he stabbed a person in the lung, so it should have been attempted murder, but that part doesn't matter because of what's going to happen next. So Larry pleads guilty to aggravated battery. His bond is set at $10,000 and Larry's friends raised the money. He was released from jail on bond 20 days after the attack. The attack. <laughs> on August 23rd, uh, and remember Larry's roommate Robert? Well, he, he paid off Craig Long. He wrote a check for $2,500 to Craig, which he said he could have if he did not press charges. And Craig accepted and Larry changed his plea to not guilty. Larry Eiler was acquitted on November 13th, 1978. Now, had this gone differently? I mean, I get that money talks, and I get that money can make a huge difference to people's lives, but however, I mean, kind of a selfish move on Craig's part. You had this person, and I'm not trying to victim blame, but you had this person who attacked you and stabbed you and handcuffed you in the back of his truck. And you, you don't take that person to court for him to pay for that. So had he, and had this gone through, considering Larry pled guilty, um, this whole story probably would have gone completely differently. The story would be done here. This would have been an episode of I Survived, uh, Survivor Saturday. It would have been done here, now, completely done. However, that is not where the story ends. And now we get to go into the next bit. So I personally see this as Larry tried to act out one of his more extravagant sexual fantasies. And sure, it didn't go to plan, but he still got away with it. So really, he came to the cops and more or less admitted his actions and he still got away with it. And I think this is a specific uh, exchange and the resulting actions kind of set a precedent for Larry. Now, I don't know if this botched attempt satiated Larry for a time or if he was laying low because for the most part, nothing eventful happens in his life for a good minute. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. And like I said, I'm no, no way, shape or form trying to victim blame on Craig for that. You know, maybe he needed the money or however, but, uh, I, I, I don't know what his reasoning for not pressing charges was, and I'm sure he had obviously no clue that this was going to go the way that it ended up going, but yeah, just want to make it clear that I'm not victim blaming. Uh, so, okay, so in 1981, Larry starts a pretty serious relationship with a 20-year-old 20, 20 married man named John Dobr wow. <laughs> Dobrovolsky. Uh, and get this, 
he lives part-time in the house with John and his wife, Sally, and their three foster children. Sally allegedly did not mind the affair, especially because Larry paid a third of the, the family's rent and mortgage to live there. Also, a good thing, John and Larry have the same kinks because they're both into masochism, and they had consensual sex that f worked for them, and uh, no one in either relationship had a problem at the surface with polygamy. In fact, neither man was really all for monogamy, but they called their relationship, quote, permanent. Unfortunately, as these things sometimes go, uh, Larry would get jealous of John's other relationship, and the two would get into heated arguments where John would hit Larry, but Larry never retaliated. So, yeah, Larry's in this consensual polygamous relationship, but um, Larry kind of catches feelings, and it I don't think it, it ruins the relationship, but it definitely ch kind of changes the dynamic of this, what was at one point started off as, like, this consensual polygamistic relationship, and then now it's just not really that anymore, even though it still kind of is. So, remember I said that Larry lived part-time with John and Sally. Their home was in Greenview, Illinois. The other part of the time, Larry is still living with Robert Little in Terre Haute, Indiana. Robert does not like the relationship that Larry is in, um, because it can be called a pretty serious relationship. Uh, Robert wasn't quite quiet about how he felt about the relationship, and this, too, started arguments. So Ed, that's not really helping either. You have this person who has a lot of self -lo self wow self loathing and self hatred, and somebody who's really struggling with their identity, with this anxiety and this separation anxiety. And you've got you're unhappy with your serious relationship and how it's going, and then your quote father figure is upset with that relationship too. So he's being pulled in a bunch of different directions. Now this, of course, does not justify anything that's done further along in this story. However, it does kind of paint a picture for the mindset that Larry could find himself with him. So at this point, and it is a point to know, Larry works full-time as a house painter in Illinois Monday through Friday, and works in a liquor store during the weekends while he stays with Robert in Terre Haute. He does this routine consistently, and he has jobs to do. Uh, the commute between the two is a straight shot east or west down I-70, and he took that in his blue Ford F-Series pickup truck. But it's easy to not account for where he is at any given time because he does not live in the same place, and he's kind of a drifter between the two. So it would be very easy for him to just tell Robert that he was with John, or John that he was with Robert, or that he picked up a shift, or whatever. So his his timelines between the two relationships that he has very blurred because he can kind of lie to whoever he wants to. He can make this he can make his uh, alibis up as he goes along. So on October twelfth, nineteen eighty two, Larry lures twenty one year old Craig Townsend into his truck in Crown Point, Indiana. Craig had been drugged beaten and then abandoned in a rural field, which Craig was naked and comatose. He got hypothermia, but overall survived the assault physically unscathed. Eleven days later, on October 23rd, Larry abducts and murders 19-year-old Stephen Crockett. His body was found in a cornfield corn near Kankakee County, roughly 12 hours after his death. Stephen was a student in Chicago, and a Chicago resident. He had a twin sister also. Stephen's body was found over 80 miles away from his listed home residence. He had been beaten and stabbed 32 times. Four of those wounds were to his head. Depending on accounts, this is possibly Larry Eiler's first confirmed victim. However, the discovery of Stephen's mutilated body raised no huge alarms for those outside of Kankakee County. Seven days later, on October 30th, 26-year-old Edgar Underkulfer disappears from Rantoul, Illinois. Unfortunately, his body won't be found until March 4th of the next year in a field close to Danville, Illinois, which is over 40 miles away. His date of death is attributed to March 4th, so it's hard to know how uh, if the accounts got him right either. Edgar was born in the Bronx. Edgar was an airman basic in the Air Force at the time of his death. There are a few Air Force bases nearby Rantoul, where he went missing from, so I think it's possible he was in Illinois for that reason. On Christmas Day, 1982, John R.F. Johnson, a.k.a. J.J., uh, his body was found near Lowell, Indiana. He had gone missing from Chicago's Uptown District in October of night, or yeah, on October 30th. He was 25 years old at the time of his disappearance. 
As of right now, because of the distance between the bodies and the time between going missing and being found, police, I don't think, really knew something was up. Which, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The communication between jurisdictions and between forces just wasn't there at the time. On December 19th, 23-year-old Stephen Agin was taken from Terre Haute, Indiana. He was a father, a brother, and a good friend to anyone who needed one. He had left his mother's home to go see a movie with some guy friends and never returned. Um, as a note of reference, Terre Haute is 150 miles south of Crown Point. Steve's body was found in the woods, close to Indiana State Road 63, uh, nine days later, which is on December 28, 1982, which was three days after JJ's body was, would be found. During the investigation, police found an abandoned farm building uh, near where Stephen Egan's body was found, and inside there was good reason to believe that Stephen had been murdered inside the barn. Autopsy technicians noted that whoever killed him had, quote, tremendous rage. The killer had slashed his throat and then repeatedly stabbed him in the abdomen. Um, at the crime scene, there was also evidence that there may have been more than one perpetrator, and that'll be important later. Uh, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, literally, right after Egan's autopsy was concluded, there was another autopsy conducted on the body of 21-year-old John Lee Roach. His body had been found in Putnam County earlier that day. There were an alarming amount of similarities in the wound patterns between Stephen Egan and John Roach, notably the overt rage exhibited by the killer. On December 30th, David Block disappears from Highland Park, which is 256 miles away from Terre Haute. David is a 22-year-old Yale grad. In an article that I found written in the Chicago, Chicago Tribune in 1994, uh, said that family members knew that he had been murdered, but at no point in time did they suspect it could have been Larry Eiler who killed him. David told his family he was going to visit a friend and never returned, and his body wasn't found until May 7th of 1984. He was found by a farmer near Illinois Route 173. On January 24, 1983, 16-year-old Irvin Gibson is killed in Lake County, Illinois. His body wasn't discovered until April 15th that same year. He was found discarded on top of the body of a dog which had also been stabbed to death. I don't know whose dog it was or why they were found together, and I don't know if anybody else does. Although police were slowly putting things together, i.e. the uptick in homicides that are directly affecting the LGBTQ community, those within the community itself had already started the moves to protect themselves. It was suspected that all these deaths were the result of a single person. Police were routinely raiding gay bars and bookstores, and also filming patrons of these premises, which is kind of weird. An LGBTQ plus newspaper called The Works, in an attempt to assist police, created an anonymous telephone hotline and published an article that speculated the identity of the serial killer and possibly the motive which their motive even picked up on the internal battle within Larry, who refused to accept his own sexuality. With assistance from members within the LGBTQ plus community and the family of one of the victims, the editors of the newspaper offered $1,500 for anyone who could give them information about the killer. At this point, Indiana police started linking several of these murders together. Between March and April of 1983, it's suspected that Larry Eiler murdered five more people between the ages of 17 and 29. These victims are John Bartlett, who was 19. He went missing on March 2nd, 1983. His remains were found at an Indiana farm, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Michael Bauer was 22. He went missing on March 8th, 1983. Uh, he went missing that day, and his remains were also found at the barn that we'll talk about in a little bit. Richard Wayne was 17. He disappeared on March 20th, 1983. His body was found on December 7th, 1983, with another John Doe near Indianapolis, which we'll get into um, that in a minute, too. Jay Reynolds was 29. He went missing on March 22nd, 1983, but this case is still considered cold. Larry Eiler was never officially connected to this crime, and Jay Reynolds was found stabbed on March 22nd off of US-25, 10 miles north of Richmond, Kentucky. He was from Lexington, Kentucky, and found stabbed to death at the bottom of an embankment alongside the US Highway 25, which runs from Lexington to Richmond, Kentucky. When he was found, he had been dece deceased for less than a day. It appears he was killed in his car and then moved because when located, he was not in the car anymore. The specific crime was mentioned in the Chicago Tribune as one of the 24 slayings attributed to Larry Eiler, although I'll admit it seems often doesn't necessarily match up with the following crimes. So he 
he is officially, unofficially attributed to Larry Eiler. And lastly, Gustavo Herrera, who's 28, he went missing on April 8th, 1983. His body was found by a construction worker in Lake County, Illinois, near the Wisconsin border. Gustavo was a resident of Chicago's Uptown District. He was a father of two. He was known to frequent gay bars. His killer had cut off his right hand and removed it, and it was never found. On May 4th, an 18-year-old boy named Jimmy Roberts disappears from the Chicago area. He was found five days later in a creek with 35 stab wounds to his body. On May 9th, the body of 21-year-old Daniel Scott McNeve was found in a field close to Indiana State Road 39. Based off his wounds, his murder was tied into the others that had been popping up all over the area. His disappearance was tied to the same perpetrator. Like the other victims, there was no sign of sexual assault, but he had been bound and viciously stabbed. He had gone missing on May 7th. At this point, Indiana police had started linking several of these murders together. After Daniel McNeve's body was found, there was a meeting held by Indiana State Police which gathered 35 detectives from each of the four jurisdictions where bodies that had met um, similar MOs were found. It was determined during this meeting that the murders had all been committed by the same person. Therefore, the four separate murder investigations that had been going on all mashed into one. This task force was called the Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigation Team, but I'll be referring to it as the task force from now on. It was commanded by Lieutenant Jerry Campbell and was made up of two detectives from state police, two detectives from Indianapolis police, and two detectives from each county involved in the manhunt. Any and all information obtained was entered into a computerized database. The first thing the task force did was so intelligent. They contacted the FBI's National Crime Information Center. They described their killer's, their killer's method of murder and body disposal, and they wanted to know if anyone else had crimes like this. That is just so freaking intelligent to do. Um, it's I really appreciate that in, like the Indiana Task Force did not think this was only limited to them, that they wanted to know if this, this killer was out and about doing more in other states. That is just so intelligent. In quick succession, investigators in Kentucky reached out about Jay Reynolds and Chicago released um, or reached out about Jimmy Roberts. Both of these victims were linked to the task force manhunt. Thus begins the hunt for the newly coined highway murderer. On May 18, 1983, 25-year-old Richard Bruce disappears near Effingham, Illinois. His body was thrown from a bridge and into a creek where he wasn't found until December 5th. On June 6, Thomas Henderson, a former lover of Larry Eilers, calls up the task force and lets them know that he thinks Larry may be the killer they're looking for. His reasoning was that Larry had told him that he'd been charged with, quote, some sort of stabbing in 1978, and that Larry had a really violent temper and was into bondage. Thomas let him know that Larry worked in a liquor store in Greencastle and lived in Terre Haute on the weekends. Thomas also let police know that Larry had drugged a 14-year-old boy back in May of 1982. The boy had not been molested in any way, but had been left in the woods close to Greencastle. Later, the task force would surmise that this was a test to see how strong the sedatives were. Based off all the information and with a solid background check completed, the task force had enough reason to keep an informal track on Larry's whereabouts, but not enough to keep him under full surveillance. In the meantime, there was an FBI profile developed on who this possible killer could be. It was suspected that the killer was a white male in his t late 20s to early 30s. He worked a menial profession and tried to look tough because he harbors a lot of self-hatred because he is homosexual. He would probably be overly macho and live on the edge of homosexual panic in fear of being labeled as a queer. Thanks to this weird trait, he would be overly aggressive and have an extreme hatred to the LGBTQ plus community in fear he would be ever considered, quote, like them. It's also suspected that the killer had a markedly more intelligent accomplice in his homicides. Because most of the victims were physically active, the killer also had to be physically strong in order to subdue his victims. This was corroborated by the deep welt marks on the wrists of his victims, meaning they resisted being bound and handcuffed. On July 2nd, the body of a Hispanic man, aged 20 to 25, was found in Ford County, Illinois. From an autopsy, he had been killed either June 27th or June 28th. He had been repeatedly stabbed in the abdomen. He is still a doe. On August 31st, a tree trimming crew found the body, found a body in a field close to Illinois Route 60. He had been stabbed to death, but was also found in a similar area to where Irvin Gibson and Gustavo Herrera were found. The victim was identified as 28-year-old Ralph Calise. He had been stabbed 17 times with a kitchen or hunting knife. 
In September of 1983, Chicago-based news reporter Geraldine Kolarik noticed the similarities between Khalees, Gibson, and Herrera's deaths. She was also aware of other murders of young males in and around the area that all had similar methods of killing. She, in cahoots with Cook County investigators, put together that two other young males had disappeared from the uptown area and had also had stab wounds, and these men were Stephen Crockett and J.J. Johnson, who had been murdered in 1982. The task force got together again to see if these five deaths, meaning Calise, Gibson, Herrera, Crockett, and Johnson's, were all part of the manhunt they were already on. The decision was yes, they probably are, and they were officially added. This meant that this man, whomever he was, had killed quite possibly over 17 young men. Larry Eiler was arrested in Lowell, Indiana, Lowell, Indiana, sorry, on September 30th for a routine traffic violation. He had a young hitchhiker with him when he was pulled over, and both men were arrested and detained for questioning. Eiler was detained on charges of soliciting a young male for sexual purposes, and unfortunately, the sergeant that arrested Eiler didn't ask for consent in or before informing Larry that he was under arrest. He searched Eiler's car and discovered two sections of nylon rope and the Ford F-Series pickup was impounded. That same day, the Indiana Task Force conducted a formal interview with Larry. They let him know that he had become a suspect based on an anonymous phone call they received from, quote, a former acquaintance of his. Eiler was open and willing to talk about everything, except his sexuality. He admitted to knowing about the murders of John Rope, Roach and Daniel McNeve because of press coverage, but obviously denied committing the homicide. During the questioning, he let investigators conduct a forensic exam of his truck, allowed his mugshot to be taken, and had his fingerprints taken, and he had also volunteered for a polygraph test at a later date. While searching Larry's truck, police found a knife, two sections of nylon rope, handcuffs, a hammer, two baseball bats, a mallet, and surgical tape. Eiler's footwear and vehicle impressions matched tracks found at Ralph Kalisa's crime scene. Blood was found under the handle of a knife in the car, and Eiler, thanks to his living arrangements, was known to commute regularly between the three districts of Indiana where several bodies had been found, which were Greencastle, Terre Haute, and Chicago. Also, based off their interview, Larry's personality pretty much matched who they were looking for. After all this, though, Larry was al allowed to leave custody under the agreement that he had to leave his vehicle with police. However, they were worried now that Larry knew that they knew something, he would try to dispose of evidence. On October 1st, really early in the morning, the task force got a search warrant and searched Robert Little's home. Um, we've come a long way in the story, so for a refresher, Robert Little was the older guy and father figure that Larry was staying with on the weekends in Terre Haute. At dawn on October 2nd, they did the search and found some circumstantial evidence, like credit card receipts that place Eiler around where the bodies were found, slash people had gone missing, and phone bills that showed that Larry had been calling Robert Little at abnormal hours and shortly after identified victims were believed to have been murdered. The phone records also had, uh, sev uh, well, at least one interesting coincidence, meaning on uh, April 8th, Larry had made a call from a pay phone near Cook County Hospital. That's the day that Gustavo Herrera was murdered. Larry was at the hospital because he received treatment for a deep cut to his hand. He told the hospital that he had fallen from his truck and landed on a glass beer bottle. Receipts found, wow, I said that stupid. Receipts found at Little's house showed that handcuffs and a knife had been purchased the following day. All of these coincidences showed investigators that if Larry weren't the killer, he was certainly following him and knew his every move. The Ford truck was investigated further and Larry was brought into questioning on, on the 2nd of October. He admitted that he liked being the dominant partner in bondage sessions and that he had a love-hate relationship with the Dobro Dobrovolskis, which again, as a reminder, is his serious partner whom was married. He said that they had argued a lot and that it would get physical, but never from his side. Dan Collin, the investigator questioning Larry, said to him, Larry, we know something about you. You'd get into a fight with John and pick someone else and stab him because you think it's John. And this accusation caused Larry Eiler to visibly wince. On October 4th, two mushroom hunters found a human torso inside a plastic bag in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. This victim was identified as 18-year-old Eric Hansen. He had last been seen alive on September 27th in St. Francis, Wisconsin. His head, arms, and legs were severed from his torso and he had been completely drained of blood. His hands and head were never found. On this day, Larry was released from custody and requested legal representation. 
he hired a Chicago lawyer named Kenneth Dick Ditkowski. This lawyer said that the police didn't have enough evidence to formally charge Larry Eiler with murder and therefore filed a civil suit against the Lake County Police Department because they were harassing him and violating his 14th Amendment rights. On October 6th, fueled by, I'm sure, frustration about Larry's lawyer claiming they didn't have enough evidence, police were like, we're gonna fucking solve this and get this guy. So boot entire imprints from Ralph Kalise's crime scene were sent to FBI headquarters. Several days later, the FBI said the boot impressions were a precise match. Blood stains, which were A positive, were found inside the footwear. Larry had super odd and specific tires, which were from two different brands, and matched the tires found at the scene. On October 18th, four more victims were found, which is the, the situation that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so, four more victims were found on October 18th. They were discovered alongside an oak tree close to an abandoned farmhouse in Lake Village, Indiana. All four victims had been there for a long time, and they were partially buried with sections of each body remaining exposed above the ground. The weirdest part of this discovery is that it was methodical. Three of the victims were Caucasian. They were all buried on one side of the tree, three feet apart, with their heads all facing north. The fourth victim, who was African-American, was buried on the other side of the tree. Uh, three of the victims have since been identified, and I'll just repeat who they were um, because they matter. John Bartlett was 19. He had gone missing on March 2nd. Michael Bauer was 22. He had gone missing on March 8th. And on April 25th, 2021, a third victim had been identified as Johnny Ingram Brandenburg Jr. of Chicago. He was 19 at the time of his death. Indiana authorities worked with the DNA Doe Project, which used genetic genealogy to find a match to a family member. The African-American male, known as Adam or Adam Doe, is still unidentified. On October 27th, the task force met to see if they had enough evidence to charge Larry Eiler with murder. They decided that they did. Investigators got a warrant for Larry Eiler's hair and blood samples. They served it on October 29th during Larry's lawyer's civil suit for not having enough evidence, and it was right after. Uh, Ditkowski's civil suit did not go as planned, and then Larry is served at the papers to collect his DNA evidence, which I thought was really kind of sassy on their part. Uh, Larry Eiler has O-positive blood, so there's that's not his blood in the boot. That same day, Larry Eiler is formally charged with the murder of Ralph Kalise. Uh, obviously, Larry had proclaimed his innocence and told media outlets that, quote, the investigation had ruined his reputation and if there were any real evidence, police would have found it. Like, they didn't fucking find your knives and handcuffs in your truck, Larry, and blood that's obviously not yours in your boot, but go off, that's fine. On November 1st, the task force got another search warrant for Robert Little's home. The goal was to see if Larry kept any souvenirs from his victims. 221 items were cataloged, but none of them were souvenirs. But police did find a key that was a precise match to a key found under the body of Stephen Agam. The key was later found to fit a door of an office where Larry had worked in 1982. So Larry's mom, Robert Little, and the Dobrovolsky family fired Kenneth Ditkowski as a lawyer for Larry. They hired a man named David Shippers on November 12th. Shippers' first move was to stop Larry Eiler from talking to the media, which was probably really intelligent on his part. On December 7th, a hunter discovered a partially buried skeleton of Richard Wayne, who had disappeared on March 20th. He had been traveling from California to his home in Montpelier, Indiana. There was a second body, albeit less decomposed, found beneath the remnants of a burned mobile home close to where Richard Wayne had been buried. This doe was an African-American male, approximately 5 foot 9, and he was somewhere between the ages of 25 and 39, and he still remains unidentified. Uh, so this is, this is where the story gets really frustrating. As if, I mean, as if it wasn't frustrating enough already. In December of 1983, it was determined that although Larry's initial arrest for the traffic violation had been legally valid, the detainment when the evidence was recovered had been obtained without probable cause, meaning it was inadmissible, and that Eiler's detention after the fact had been illegal. There was a hearing scheduled for January 23rd of 1984 to go over all the evidence that had been found through the searches. And there's a whole bunch of legal jargon that ensues, but the end story is that all the evidence that the task force had was obtained more or less illegally and wasn't allowed to be used against Larry. Also, he had been detained illegally 
and that whole rigmarole. So all the evidence that police had against Eiler more or less had to be suppressed, which means the boots, the impressions, the blood sample, everything. Larry's bond sum was reduced to 10k, which Robert Little paid to have him released from prison on February 6, 1984. And based on bond, though, Larry was not allowed to leave Illinois. So in mid-February, Larry permanently relocates to Chicago. Robert Little rented him an apartment, which he paid for and furnished, and he also bought Larry new tires for his truck. It was supposed to be a secret to John where Larry's new address was, because the lawyer thought that was a good idea, but he found out anyways. So everything's pretty quiet for now. On the evening of August 19th, 1984, Larry lures 16-year-old Daniel Bridges to his apartment. Daniel was the youngest of 13 children. Um, it, the story goes that he was neglected and often known to run away. Uh, he was known to be heterosexual, but worked as a male prostitute or sex worker. That was the doc, the, <laughs> the article's wording, but he was a male sex worker. He started at the age of 12. Ironically, Daniel had known Irvin Gibson, one of Larry Eiler's victims. Weirdly enough, it's known that Daniel Bridges knew who Larry Eiler was and he was scared of him. Daniel Bridges had interviewed for a documentary documentary, sorry, in June of 1984, which is so crazy. The documentary was supposed to be about child exploitation in America, but they got Daniel Bridges on there saying that Larry Eiler was a, quote, real freak, and he was well known to the male sex workers in Uptown. Larry Eiler lured Daniel to his apartment, and Daniel was bound to a chair with a clothesline and then had been beaten, tortured, and stabbed to death. Uh, Larry dismembered Daniel's body in his bathroom, and the body was cut in eight pieces and then completely drained of blood and then put into six large plastic bags. On the morning of August 21st, a janitor named Joseph Bala found the remains. The body had been put in a dumpster close to Eiler's unit, but it wasn't for the unit. Those people were, like, the people who lived in Larry Eiler's apartment complex were not supposed to be putting their trash, their trash bags there. So, that was suspicious. Joseph thought the bags had been put there illegally, like illegally dumped into the dumpster where they weren't supposed to be, so he was going to remove them and put them in the dumpster they were supposed to go in. When he pulled one of the bags out, it broke and revealed a severed human, human leg. So obviously, Joseph went to the police and he told them that uh, one of the other janitors observed a man named Larry Eiler put those bags in the trash the day before. When asked what he was throwing away, Eiler had said, quote, just getting rid of some shit from my apartment. Within minutes, Eiler was arrested in his apartment. He had been with John, who was arrested as well, but released. Forensics looked through Eiler's apartment and found that an alarming amount of blood had recently cleaned from his bedroom, which had been repainted, but there was blood on the floor, walls, and ceiling. More blood was found on a mattress, a chair, a leather belt, a sofa, and beneath the floorboards. Daniel Bridges' jeans were found in Larry's closet, and they were blood-soaked. Daniel's t-shirt, which was a distinctive one he was known to wear, was in the hamper, also soaked in blood. A hacksaw was found on the property, along with receipts to prove that Larry had bought it. Larry Eiler's fingerprints were found on the bags that Daniel was found in, on the inside and the outside. On August 22nd, Larry was formally charged with the murder of Daniel Bridges. He claimed that his fingerprints ended up on the bags when he had moved them aside as he placed something else in the dumpster. In order to seek the death penalty, Eiler was charged with felonies of aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, and concealment of a body on top of the murder charge. His trial started on July 1st, 1986. A trial is a trial, but the most ridiculous from it was that Larry's defense said that there were eyewitnesses to the trash scenario, but no one could prove that Larry had killed Daniel. I would beg, I would argue that... <laughs> that he looks innocent in this situation. Uh, Robert Little and the Dobrolovskis testified in trial, which everyone had agreed that Larry had been acting odd and dodgy during the time the crime had been committed. The jury deliberated for exactly three hours before coming back with a guilty verdict on all counts. On September 30th and 31st, meetings were held to figure out the punishment for Larry Eiler's crime. The prosecutor in the case, Richard Stock, found four individuals who had been assaulted and or left for bet dead by Larry Eiler between 1978 and 1981. The defense, Shipper, brought in four character witnesses who were Larry's mother, his stepsister, his stepfather, and a Catholic cha cha chaplain. Shipper's uh, 
So he was just trying to get the death penalty taken off the table. On October 3rd, the judge formally sentenced Larry Eiler to die by lethal injection. And here's, here's a quote from the judge who he, he apparently really, based off his own religious beliefs, really did not want to give Larry the death penalty just because he didn't feel like that passionate about it. But here's what he said about Larry. The senseless and barbaric murder of a 16-year-old boy, a killing which is so brutal it defies description, shows me your complete disregard for human life. If there ever was a person or a situation for which the death penalty is appropriate, it is you. You are an evil person. You truly deserve to die for your acts. I thereby sentence you to death for the murder of Danny Bridges, committed during the course of his aggravated kidnapping. After that, Larry was sent to the Pontiac Correctional Center and stayed on death row. He was evaluated during his stay, and it was concluded that he suffered from a severe borderline personality disorder. Because of his chaotic upbringing and sensitivity toward abandonment, the psychiatrist thought if or when Larry suffered some type of rejection or perceived abandonment, he would turn around and murder. So any of those arguments between Robert Little or any of those arguments with John, instead of acting out violently towards those people, he would turn around and take it elsewhere. Fast forward to May of 1988. Uh, Larry has filed for an appeal saying that, yeah, he had dismembered and disposed of Daniel's body, but only because Robert Little killed him. The appeal was heard on May 10th, 1989 and dismissed on October 25th. Larry Eiler was set to be executed on March 14th, 1990, but that was obviously canceled because this case gets crazier. In November of 1990, a different county prosecutor found the evidence that had been thrown out in the Ralph Khaleesi case. He wanted to charge Larry Eiler with the murder of Stephen Egan, which happened in 1982. Surprisingly, Larry voluntarily confessed to this, his part in the murder, but maintained that he had not killed Daniel Bridges. He agreed to confess and testify against Robert Little, but wanted fixed time as opposed to uh, another death sentence. His offer was accepted, and Eiler wrote a 17-page confession that was turned in on December 4th. Larry Eiler pled guilty and received 60 more years on his sentence, and Robert Little, if convicted, would also receive 60 years. After this, Larry said that he would confess to 20 further homicides over the 10 counties in Illinois and Indiana if the state would commute his death penalty to life without parole. He said that if he didn't accept, if they didn't accept, uh, he would take his secrets to the grave. Eight out of ten counties accepted the offer. The ninth was waiting to hear what Cook County did, and Cook County rejected the offer. Robert Little was ultimately tried for the killing of Stephen Egan. Uh, the jury deliberated for seven hours and found Little not guilty. Larry Eiler died in the infirmary of Pontiac Correctional Center on March 6, 1994. His death was due to AIDS, to an AIDS complication, and he had been very ill for 10-ish days before he finally passed away. He was 41 years old when he died. In a posthumous confession, Larry said that he typically lured his victims with promises of drugs, alcohol, money, or transport. He also said that he gave the victims t-shirts to Robert Little for his sexual pleasure. Kathleen Zellner, who had been Larry's attorney at the end and when he passed away, had released his confession and maintained, for Eiler, that Robert Little was part of it. She also said that Larry had been formally diagnosed with AIDS in 1991 and, quote, knew when he testified at Little's trial in the Stephen Egan murder that he was dying. I believe Larry was truthful. Larry had no incentive to lie any to anyone. In the confession, Larry stated that he had killed 10 people in Indiana and 10 people in Illinois. And... That's kind of where the story ends. There is, uh, you might be wondering what happened to everybody else in this story um, after this chaotic, you know, just Larry came in like a wrecking ball and just ruined so many people's lives. And I mean, everybody around him was affected negatively as well. But after Larry was arrested, John moved to California. He eventually returned to his wife, Sally. John Dobr Dobrovolsky died of AIDS in January of 1990 at the age of 29. After Robert Little was acquitted for murder in the Stephen Egan case in 1991, he returned to his teaching position at Indiana State University. He maintained his innocence and said he knew nothing about the murders. Uh, Kathleen Zellner, Larry's attorney that tried to help him, said that she would never knowingly defend another guilty individual. And um, there was somebody who I mentioned earlier, the newscaster, I just want to, I want to plug her really quick because she had a really good book that had a lot of this information. Her name is Geralind Cleric. 
She wrote a book called Freed to Kill, the true story of serial murderer Larry Eiler. Um, most of the information that I have is from her book. It is really good. I mean, there's so much information on this case. And if you want to deep dive it, I think her book is probably the best to read. Um, well, I am shocked that I was able to do that in one episode and I didn't have to cut that in half. So kudos to me for not going on any weird sidebars and just getting the information out. <laughs> that almost never happens. Uh, this was your True Crime Tuesday. So thank you for listening to the end. I appreciate it. I hope I hope this case was enlightening to just the psychology behind why people do what they do, even if it doesn't make any sense to us normal people. It makes sense to them when they do these things. So um, that's what I have. I have a Instagram, Cavernian True Crime. Honestly, if you just search Cavernian True Crime on any social media or YouTube, you will find me. I am the only one. And um, I... Yeah, so that's all I have. Um, thank you for listening, and I will see you guys next.